Greeting and greetings and welcome. So we're coming towards the end. Today we'll do a little bit of kind of uh, reframing of a lot of the issues we've talked about throughout the semester. As I'm sure you remember vividly, we've seen many, many examples of serious adverse incidents or accidents, um, ranging from gas plants to nu nuclear power plants, aviation, hospital mistakes, chemical production facilities, accidents across a wide range of industrial and technological settings. We've talked about Fukushima, we've talked about Three Mile Island, the Boeing 737 MAX, Chernobyl, the Deepwater Horizon accident, and we've also looked at uh, important theories and analytical frameworks for trying to understand and provide a deeper explanation of the factors which lead to large-scale technology failures large-scale technology accidents in the contemporary world. So we've um, discussed normal accident theory, theory with uh, Chuck Perel. We've talked about the normalization of deviance theory. There was um, Diane Vaughn's contribution and her reconstruction of the uh, Space Shuttle Challenger disaster. We've talked about high reliability organizations theory and the, the hopeful idea that it's possible to design organizations in ways that minimize the likelihood of catastrophic accident. We've also talked about system safety engineering and the, again, hopeful um, view that it's possible to design technology systems, software systems, and maybe also bureaucratic systems, which are more fault tolerant, more resilient in the face of uh, deviation. We've talked about regulation and regulatory effectiveness and regulatory dysfunction. And we talked about the very interesting, very tantalizing idea of safety case regimes. So people, authorities like Perot, Vaughn, Nancy Levison, uh, Sagan, Wyke and Sutcliffe, Andrew Hopkins, these are important figures in what I have kind of taken to calling safety science. So let's kind of remember where all the trouble comes from in the contemporary world. These were not issues that the world had to worry about um, so much in the 19th century or the 18th century. We've had an industrial revolution going for 200 years, but it's really the 20th century and the 21st century where large-scale catastrophic technology catastrophe is possible. And there are certain features of modern industrial and technological systems which make accidents more hazardous. Uh, first, modern industrial and technological systems are highly complex. They involve many ongoing simultaneous processes, many interlocking control systems, and many pathways to failure of subsystems. This is the point that, which is especially under, underlined by uh, uh, Charles Perrault, but it comes out in almost everything that we've read. Second, some industrial and technological systems also have the potential for, for releasing large amounts of energy um, through explosion, fire, or steam, or large amounts of toxic products, whether gases or contaminated water, that can cause significant harm to workers, the public, or the environment. The amount of damage which can be done by some contemporary technology systems is vastly greater than was the case um, 100 or 150 years ago. And third, industrial and technological systems of today involve the application of scientific knowledge and engineering science at the very cutting edge. And therefore, there is a good deal of uncertainty in the, both the science and the, um, the workings of the designs and the artifacts and the, the machines and the, um, the uh, physical systems as designed and implemented. Simulation is often used as a tool for trying to um, work out what the dynamic properties of a system will be, but we've also seen that simulations have their own limitations. And there's uh, the question of um, under what circumstances can we rely on the simulation of a nuclear power plant um, to let us have a realistic appraisal of what the hazards and risks are. We've talked about a whole handful of factors which create risks in modern industrial and technological systems. System complexity, tight coupling, and rapid 
interactive dynamics across processes. We saw that in great um, vivid detail in some of Andrew Hopkins' uh, descriptions of gas plants and chemical plants, for example. The complicated flows and pumps and um, uh, conditional um, uh, efforts to control processes, the, these systems are incredibly complex and that complexity gives rise to the possibility of interactive um, incidents which lead to failure. Uh, third, there is a dependence on advanced engineering and science teams. It's a little different from the point I made in the previous slide that the technologies themselves are uncertain, but there's a, a new source of potential error in the fact that uh, the design of a nuclear power plant or for that matter, a chemical plant or a gas plant any really huge complex system requires breaking the, the design problem down into multiple parts. And I think when we uh, uh, get the presentation about the Boeing 737 MAX, we'll see some of that in terms of the, um, the uh, effort to modularize the design process for the uh, attitude control system, which was implemented with disastrous consequences. In other words, uh, managing the design process um, through uh, a number of teams of advanced engineers with design specifications, that process by itself can give rise to errors and accidents and unintended um, uh, cross connections across different processes. Uh, this is a point which um, comes out very vividly in Nancy Levison's account of the different ways in which we've seen in the space program that design processes in uh, designing space vehicles has led to major accidents, uh, not usually with a major loss of life, but sometimes with billions of dollars of cost of har hardware and development costs. Uh, third, there is a dependence of any complex technology on organizations, on organizational leadership, the priorities of the leadership, the management uh, system in place, the oversight which is exercised on the process and the ways in which resources are invested in the process. Furthermore, and I'll talk about this a little bit more in the next couple of minutes, uh, there is a dependence often on a parent corporation whose interests may be rather different from the immediate safety and production interests of the local plant. So the relationship between the corporation, which may be headquartered in Chicago, and the design and manufacturing plants in Seattle, um, there, there may be a conflict of uh, priority and goal between corporate objectives and local firm objectives. And then finally, we've spent a fair amount of time talking about um, the importance of government regulation and also the challenges which exist, um, which make effective government regulation of hazardous industries more difficult. There are some social facts which work in favor of safety. Uh, the, probably the most compelling and most pervasive is that um, it is certainly not in the financial interest or the economic interest of a company to have a major safety crisis. So uh, companies are able to recognize that when their competitors or firms in other industries have a major safety crisis, a major catastrophe, um, the cost in terms of reputation and, and sometimes um, the actual um, financial cost is uh, very great. And therefore, there's a, an interest in organizing production in such a way that um, safety goals are implemented as part of the operating philosophy of the firm. That, that is the most favorable case. And then related with that is the idea that um, some companies are also interested in conveying to the public that in addition to their um, their interest in profitability and uh, their performance on, uh, on Wall Street, they also have an interest in um, activities and business actions which are favorable to public health, public safety, and environmental quality. So that's one set of interests, um, a kind of convergence between the safety and health interests of the public and the commercial and um, uh, business interests of various firms. Now, obviously, that um, co correspondence of interests is not very exact, or we wouldn't have the kinds of accidents which we've talked about throughout this whole semester. Secondly, almost every advanced um, 
economy does have regulatory oversight um, th through government agencies. And we've seen that there's a lot of variation in the effectiveness of regulation. But um, the existence of regulation in, let's say, nu the nuclear sector um, is itself an important um, influence uh, which pushes in the direction of increasing safety, even though we've seen so many areas in which regulation has failed in the nuclear industry uh, in many different areas. A third uh, possibility is one we've spent a couple weeks talking about, and that is um, the possibility that technology itself may be marshaled to improve safety. And this is the point that Nancy Levinson has built her career around. It's the idea about systems engineering and the idea that engineering teams and engineering design needs to be reoriented so that it uh, thinks about the question of um, system safety as a whole rather than simply component safety. And then finally, we, we have noticed in several of the cases, including Fukushima, that um, uh, public interest groups and worker advocacy groups and citizen groups can have some effect on enhancing the safety of various industries. We didn't talk very much about um, the topic of um, the siting decisions for nuclear power plants, but um, it is an interesting fact in this country that um, it's been very, very difficult to um, establish and develop new nuclear plants since the Three Mile Island disaster. And some people might say that it's, uh, it's been more challenging than it really should be. But in any case, uh, citizen groups, um, uh, local um, uh, residential groups and workers groups do have some ability to pressure industry to increase safety. So design failure is an important source of technology failure. Uh, it is um, a, a fact, it's, it's, it's both a scientific fact, but it's also a sociological fact that industrial and technological systems are in fact designed. They are built and developed and uh, uh, implemented by extended groups of engineers, scientists, and technicians with a, a high level of division of labor concerning design, calculation, instrumentation, and measurement. And assess, assessment of the effects of various sub-processes, interaction effects, and failure scenarios can be performed at the unit level and at the supervisory level. But similarly, it's possible to have interaction effects which are not identified within the design process. That would be one kind of fault. Another kind of fault is internal to the design process itself, a failure of communication across two different working groups um, so that the product which is being dev devised by group A is correct according to the specifications which it has um, been pursuing, but not what was expected by group B. Uh, there is the question of the challenge of project management in the design and integration of large technology systems. And this is a very great challenge. A person we haven't talked about, who, but whose work I admire very much, is Thomas Hughes, an historian of science and technology, really more an history, uh, historian of technology. And um, he has quite a bit to say about the big um, engineering projects and science technology projects um, of the 20th century and what a sociologically, organizationally challenging um, project it is to integrate the design of a missile system or an early warning system or um, a scheduling system for um, uh, air reservations and so forth. And in fact, one thing which we have learned now from Nancy Levison, um, systems of various kinds are, are often not fully modular, so that there are unexpected, p potentially harmful, potentially hazardous interactions across subsystems which were not designed for, not intended, and yet may have um, serious consequences, hazardous consequences. And then finally, within the design process, um, it's very possible to have limited communication across research groups and mutual misunderstanding of project goals, which allow for um, a, um, a mismatch between the, the uh, designs being brought forward by one group and the ability to fit those designs into the larger system which is being developed. Let's turn now to corporate and agency failures. And what I mean by this is both private sector, corporation 
failures, but also public sector government agency failures. And the thing that we have noticed, and I think we really have to underline, is that large industrial and technological systems are embedded within large organizations, within business firms, corporations, and they are also uh, located within a network of government agencies. And each of those higher level organizations have a variety of priorities and a variety of ways of influencing the behavior at the firm level. So that's one kind of um, source of error, a source of um, uh, hazard which we've identified. A second is um, the possibility that um, leaders of an organization, leaders of the Ford Motor Company or the Boeing Aircraft Company, uh, the leaders may be so remote from the technical details of the production process that they are no longer able to give uh, good oversight and good direction to the decisions made by the company. And this seems to have been true in Boeing, not only in the Boeing 737, but also um, some important um, problems that have developed in the manufacturing system for the Dreamliner, which is um, uh, a next generation aircraft which Boeing is developing. And it is often alleged or asserted that the leaders at headquarters in Chicago are just so far from the manufacturing process that they don't really have a good sense of what needs to be established in a factory in order to have high quality aircraft manufacturing. Um, something that we noticed from Andrew Hopkins is uh, the point about uh, communicating about best practices across various units of a company. Ford Motor Company has experimented over time with trying to have a kind of a central knowledge base so that um, manufacturing or industrial challenges which are um, encountered and dealt with in Spanish Ford factories or Chinese Ford factories would be made available in a common database. And then uh, if there's a similar challenge in Mexico or in the United States, um, uh, managers and uh, industrial designers are able to take advantage of that uh, previous knowledge. But the reality is that uh, corporations are not very good at that um, effort to communicate internal knowledge of what the best practices are, what the emerging challenges are, and by the way, what some of the near misses are which have uh, been encountered in one site or another. And we saw that being a really important problem in Longford, where the specific failure which occurred at Longford is, is a situation which, is, which had occurred in other uh, SO plants in other parts of the, of the world, but um, the parent corporation had not done a good job of communicating those uh, concerns to the factories in, or the, the uh, refineries in, Australia. And then finally, but maybe most importantly, corporations and firms often place uh, the highest priority on production efficiency, continuity of production, and profitability to the disadvantage of safety considerations and investment in safety. And so we've seen a, 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 an almost constant pressure between production pressure, cost cutting, and profitability on the one hand, and the additional investments, additional attention, additional time, which is needed in order to ensure that a given process is at a very high level of safety. Within corporations, um, we, we've seen uh, commonly the uh, fact that um, the corporation, SO or Exxon or BP, the corporation is interested in maximizing profits, reducing costs, and enhancing valuation for, for shareholders. And these economic concerns are, of course, a part of running a business, no doubt about it. But um, I think almost all of our observers have noticed that if that becomes the leading priority and safety becomes a kind of cosmetic add-on, then it's very likely that firms and um, industrial processes will encounter um, significant accidents over time. So that cost-cutting measures um, are often seen to undercut safety initiatives and a lack of investment in resources in personnel and equipment um, is justified on the basis that it's, um, it, it's an ability to um, reduce the cost of production 
enhanced profitability, but it has the effect of uh, lowering safety. And then production pressure also, we've already talked about that. The urgency which managers and directors have to keep the flow of product moving, whether it's in a gas plant or a petroleum plant or the space shuttle program, keep the launch rate up um, across many sectors, keep the number of patients flowing through a clinic high. Production pressure can be uh, a strong detriment to maintaining a safe operation. Turning now to operational and management systems, um, there's, this is, I'm thinking here of the, uh, the operation and oversight and management of a specific plant, like the chemical plant that we learned about in uh, India a couple of weeks ago. Um, a, a plant may employ 1,000, 2,000 people, and it has its own management structure, and the tasks which are performed within the plant are managed by executives, supervisors, mid-level um, directors, engineers, operators, technicians, and in theory, each of these tasks, each of these uh, specialized jobs has been fine-tuned to play a specific role within the management and operation of the plant. Um, training programs have been established to make sure that people have the, uh, the right set of skills to perform their jobs, but we have seen repeatedly that um, errors and mistakes and hazards can arise in an industrial technological um, um, operation when training is faulty, supervision is faulty, individuals don't actually have the skills necessary to uh, perform their job, or supervisors and managers are not paying attention to the right kinds of things. And there is, of course, the uh, familiar observation that um, no management system can assume error-free activity. To err is human. Uh, mistakes will happen, and so the task of organizational design and then organizational implementation is to allow for the possibility of error and find ways of being resilient in the face of errors so that one error doesn't lead to um, a substantial catastrophic outcome. At the level of the plant, what kinds of uh, failures or dysfunctions can lead to a large disaster. We've looked at um, the, the fact that safety culture is an important component of um, safe operations of a plant. And we've also noticed that uh, safety culture is uh, not an obvious concept. Um, there, it's, uh, it's possible for directors or executives or managers to believe that they are enhancing and um, implementing safety culture because they're minimizing days lost to injury, but they're not paying any attention to um, the issue of system safety and large-scale system failure within the plant. So by their definition, they have a safety culture, but it's not aimed at the right kind of failure. A second plant level source of failure, uh, deferred investment in maintenance, inspection, and uh, the right level of engineering staff uh, we've also seen instances of failure of communication. I uh, remember in, uh, I guess it was the nuclear plant, where the, um, the night shift handover of um, uh, the record of the previous eight hours of activity in the control room didn't get properly handed off. Actually, it was the gas plant. I think it was one of um, Andrew Hopkins' examples. But the handoff in the control room from control room supervisor of the night shift to the day shift was inadequate, and so the day shift was unaware that there was an emerging problem in the column of um, flammable stuff. So failures of communication is an important source of error. Failures of reporting systems for accidents in near misses. We've seen how important it is to have uh, open, unencumbered reporting of accidents in near misses with the idea of kind of a no-blame environment, and in fact, Many organizations just have a very hard time implementing that idea. Um, a more common result is that uh, workers, frontline workers, supervisors are more inclined to cover up failures um, or bad inspection reports in order not to get in trouble. And that's itself a source of um, potential failure in the future. Technical sources of failure. These are the kind of things which we've seen in Nancy Levison, but we've also seen in a number of the other books and articles that we've read. Component failure is quite straightforward. 
your brakes fail once in a while, the little computer dealy in your car sometimes fails, has to be swapped out. But uh, Nancy Levison makes the point that component failure is not the most important source of failure. Uh, more important is when there are interaction effects between components and other subsystems. This was true in the Boeing 737 MAX, for example, where there's a sensor failure and the software um, glitch, which together led to the tendency to crash. Um, so system failure occurring um, where the components are functioning according to specification, but their interactions are leading to failure, that's an important technical source of failure. And Nancy Levison has done a great deal of work in um, trying to design a system safety um, set of guidelines for designing systems in a way that make them resilient, minimize the likelihood of an adverse event or accident, or minimize the likelihood of a mistreatment of a patient in a hospital system. Um, I, I think um, one thing that we probably need to observe is that Nancy Levison believes that there's a lot of technology that can be used to improve safety in a complex system. But at the same time, that doesn't mean that um, we can eliminate error or that we can eliminate human beings from the process. So maintaining safety is an ongoing challenge. Government sources of failure. Uh, why would regulatory systems fail to ensure nuclear safety or chemical plant safety or hospital safety? And what we have found um, in a number of instances is that um, the incentives and priorities which guide government officials are sometimes just as much at odds with the public's interest as are corporate leaders' incentives and priorities. And so there may be a kind of a tendency or a, a need to avoid offending the business sector. I think we've seen that in both the chemical industry and the nuclear industry. Um, sometimes there's a political incentive or imperative to pay attention to the needs of large donors. Uh, people who have the ear of the president may get special consideration uh, with regard to their industry needs. Um, a concern not to embarrass the president um, by postponing a challenger launch, for example. Um, being budget constrained, having not enough budget at uh, Nuclear Regulatory Commission or the EPA to carry out the mission. That would be another source of failure. And where does that failure trace back to? It traces back to the Congress, which under funds the regulatory agency and then sets a medium high standard of safety assurance. The impulse to delegate regulatory authority to the industry is a powerful impulse, and we've seen many reasons to think that it's, um, uh, it's, it's a dangerous impulse. Nancy Levison uh, kind of forces us to ask the question, are there approaches and techniques for designing systems in such a way, that both the technology system and the management system, that um, we can um, have high reliability systems, both high reliability organizations and high reliability interlocking systems like a nuclear power plant. And this is a, a, an absolutely valuable task to put in front of engineers designing complex technology artifacts. At the same time, the, I think the jury is out about how much hazard we can take out of large complex technologies. Is system safety an alternative theory? The article you read for today, I think it's just a stupendous article, really an excellent article. And Levison does believe that uh, system safety engineering is an alternative theory. She does believe that there are design principles that can be um, relied on to enhance system safety overall. She refers to redundancy in another context. She refers to checklists. Um, but she also um, believes that both redundancy and checklists are only a tool, and they're not a um, not a um, they're, they're not uh, avenues which allow us to solve every problem. Uh, she, so she so she does think that system safety is a complementary paradigm, and um, if we were kind of thinking of a map of the theories in play then system safety engineering would be one of the four or five theories we've talked about this year. Um, in, and she believes that system safety engineering can take a lot of the cost out of 
the problem of ensuring uh, safe operation of an otherwise hazardous industry. The learning organization, this is uh, maybe the, I don't know if it's the most important, it's one very important part of what I think high reliability organization theory allows us to learn. And it is the fact that an organization which is involved with um, the, the possibility of hazard to the public really needs to look at itself as a learning organization. It needs to learn from past near misses. Um, it needs to learn from uh, past perhaps minor failures and um, figure out how did that failure occur? How did that near miss occur? And that means having a reporting um, opportunity for all workers, all contributors, all members of staff to bring forward their concerns about incidents and then to investigate those, um, those incidents. Why do we need regulation? I'm not going to dwell on this because the lecture is going on a little bit too long anyway, but um, we, it's um, kind of straightforward. Complex hazardous industries need regulation because of the profit incentive and the production pressure incentive. It's possible to externalize harm and risk in such a way that the public pays the cost rather than the private corporation. And um, in a perfectly free market economy, we would expect a lot of environmental pollution. We would also expect a lot of um, unsafe behavior because it's possible to simply offload the risky practices, the hazardous practices, and the environmentally harmful practices. But as we've just seen, regulation brings its own limits and difficulties. Uh, those challenges include um, the uh, powerful industry resistance, or what we called regulatory capture several times. Um, sometimes regulators do inadequate supervision. So they may have only three inspectors to cover two plants, two nuclear plants, let's say, with the result that it's um, very easy for the operator of the plant to conceal or just never discover um, defects which are potentially very dangerous. Um, if the, the agency itself lacks on staff scientific and technical expertise, um, and it may be in the nuclear industry, but it might be in the financial industry, if the expertise is not present, then it's very difficult to write intelligent legislation which actually protects the public against hazard. And then finally, the need to protect regulatory agencies from other kinds of political forces, whether it's the Congress, wanting to loosen regulation of an industry in their particular state, or other agencies which have a different agenda, or the president and the president's staff and advisors. Perot, I'm, I'm not going to dwell on this, but Perot has a particular theory about why regulatory agencies in the US um, system tend to fail. And putting it um, very um, simply, it's in his opinion because the Nuclear Regulatory Commission and many other regulatory agencies are directly reportable to the Congress. And the Congress is, is an agency, is an entity for transmitting influence. And so it's not surprising that regulatory agencies would be subject to influence. Are there other voices for safety? And uh, I, here, I, this is what I was referring to a little while ago, are there uh, non-governmental and non-profit uh, voices which can make the case for safety? And we've seen several of them, actually. The Union for Concerned Scientists on the side of environment uh, organizations like Friends of the Earth and the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists. These are all organizations which have significant expertise and significant voice. So that's one kind of voice for safety. And uh, these organizations have, in fact, created a national visible ability to influence government and influence um, the or organizations, public and private, which are involved in these hazardous activities. So this is the final slide, the role for safety science. And it's really kind of my appeal to you as students who've taken this course, but who will now go, go on eventually um, to careers in some way relating to public policy. And I would like to put it, um, the, the importance of this course to you in these terms. I would like to say that the theories we've looked at do not constitute, we shouldn't even imagine that they constitute a comprehensive theory 
of technological safety. That's not what they're intended to be. They're rather intended to be analytical frameworks for understanding some aspects of the causes of uh, either the causes of dysfunction and failure or possibly the causes of consistent ability to d deliver um, high reliability, safe results. Um, so it's kind of a patchwork approach rather than the idea of a single comprehensive theory of industrial safety. Um, what I believe is the case is that uh, most valuable in the study of industrial and technological safety is careful study of important case studies. Um, th that's why I find your project so interesting. And it's, uh, it's uh, uh, I think, a very important source of learning for people who have any role at all in the management or oversight or implementation of large technology systems by studying important cases, um, we get a better sensibility for uh, how accidents occur and what steps need to be taken in order to be vigilant and to be resilient. And therefore, I would say the, the target of safety science is the actors within industrial technological systems, including executives, managers, supervisors, boards of directors, and operators about how to enhance safety and avoid catastrophic failure. And I would finally put it in language which is familiar from the high reliability organization framework. The goal is to change the mental frameworks of the actors who are involved in complex industrial and technological systems so that we can give them or help them come to a deeper ability to perceive their organization in hazard and accident terms.